Hello, and welcome to Structured Change. Don't tell them it's asset management. I say that tongue in cheek because often in an organization, I experience the term asset management can often be a method to glaze over eyes, especially in um, top management in the executive ranks. The reason being is because many people associate asset management traditionally with span turning, um, maintenance, production, etc., and don't understand how the modern asset management, especially in the last decade with the advent of ISO 55000 and PAS 55, that the principles of asset management are actually the glue that hold everything together. So the strategy that I like to bring together with dealing with stakeholders is talk in and around the principles of asset management and at a point in time, reflect back to your stakeholder groups, especially top management, and have them realize that the change journey that you've exercised has been done on the back of asset management. Then you're at a point where you can start to talk a little bit more tactical and strategic about how you actually refer to the different functions in an organization, how you can actually convert or maybe change weak matrix to strong matrix or strong matrix to weak matrix, whatever, to achieve organizational objectives. When top management truly understand asset management or an asset management system is there to sustain and impact the successful and sustainable delivery of value to stakeholders, all of a sudden the light bulbs go off and you will find them using the term asset management. So this next presentation, we'll just look at some basics about how you can actually position a discussion with senior stakeholders or your peers or whoever in an organization. And you'll see from these very basic conversational pieces, you're actually embedding com the conversation of asset management from word go. Anyway, let's take a look and you'll see the lighter side of how to introduce asset management to your change journey and to your organization. Let's take a look. This presentation goes hand in hand with the, the other video we have, which is three questions to help explain asset management. The difference here is these particular questions cut down right into the detail and really get people to consider the right answers to some of the more technical questions. Each one ties into the other function. For instance, all of them will have a reliability impact, all of them will have a financial impact, maintenance impact, et cetera, et cetera. You know, on this slide here, I put down some of the words that jump off the page for me when I'm thinking asset management. I'm not gonna read them all, but you can see asset management is made up of a lot of different capabilities, both technical, commercial, etc., and trying to address each and every one of them and explain it differently would be too exhausting and you wouldn't be able to do it. So let's just take a look at these questions of how I can get each stakeholder involved with the screen you're looking at now to actually have buy-in to the following questions. Easiest one to start with, what do we actually have? You know, I say talk about an asset portfolio, but even if I was um, a plumber and my system was all the equipment that I have to be able to do my work to deliver value to customers, I might have a compressor, I might have ladders, I might have a vehicle, excuse my drawing, I might have tools and spanners and meters, etc. All those sit in my asset portfolio and from that I really need to know what I have for the simple reason that if someone asks me to do a job, I know whether I have the equipment to do it or I may have to go out and procure or borrow equipment to do it. But knowing what we have is very important. Where is it? Well, if I've got a system and I might have a big plant and that could be one mile wide by one mile high, I could have pipes, I could have all this complicated equipment and if I have got a little widget over here, a little widget over here, and a little widget over here, and they're identical, can I actually put my hand on my heart and tell myself or know where they exist? Because if there's a fault in that one and I need to replace it, I, know, I would like to know that I can go out with confidence and know where the others are, especially in a shutdown. We can't buy the part anymore. Now, 
this goes back a long time ago when I was working at a place that had a lot of old relays in their system. So all these old relays, mechanical relays, wore out, they burnt out, or they simply just corroded because they were really 1940s technology. Now, when you can't um, buy any parts anymore, you need to actually have to go out to market and find out, well, what is the equivalent part? So what we might have had was an old relay. Now we've got a solid state chip that can do the same job. Well, that might work well in isolation, but how does one replace that with this in an existing system? And what needs to change in that system to accommodate the new fit form and function? So we call this obsolescence management. Who do we go to to determine fit form and function? Often organizations will leave that to supply chain who have bought something many times before. But a, a simple example could be a pump is broken. So you've got a pump, it's got an intake here, it's got an outlet here. Anyway, can't buy it anymore. So what do you know? Supply chain come and find out that there's another pump, but it's made of slightly a different alloy. They think, wow, this is great. This is very expensive here, but this one's only a margin of the cost. However, without getting engineering to look at it, supply chain might not know that that alloy will react in the chemical environment in which it sits. So again, engineering is very important to determine fit, form and function. How much does this part, part cost us? Well, if you look at a cost chart, you've got dollars here and then you've got time along the bottom, what you can say with confidence is, and this is buying an asset outright of course, forgetting leasing models, we've got a cost up front of capital, and then we've got a maintenance cost. So the cost of capital is up here, and then what happens is through maintenance cost and supply cost, it tends to get cheaper in those first early years, but then when maintenance starts to overtake because it starts to misperform, you end up at a point in time that the item will start to cost you money. Now again, that's determining the cost. So finance, of course, for the capital part and reliability, and between the two entities usually come up with what is the whole of life cost. Very important to understand. How, should, how many should we have of these in stock? Now, if I'm maintenance over here, I might say, look, I need 25 of these things in, in stock because I don't want to run the risk of them running out. Operators may say the same. So you've got maintenance and operations pushing for 25. You've got the owner over the other side who's saying, no way, we can't afford it. You're going to have five in the stock. But then, of course, you've got the asset manager sitting in the middle and you can see through their relationship with both supply chain and reliability, they may determine scientifically that eight is the optimal number. But the reliability team and the supply chain team will apply science to it, and it's not a black and white answer because you need to consider if I've got a distributed network of machinery, I might have a thousand kilometers in between, in which case I'd have to probably have eight at each site. Now, the next element in terms of asset management often overlook is competency. If I have an individual and that individual is doing a task and I ch on a particular asset, if I was to change the asset so it looked different, I still have an individual, but my tasks need to be done differently because the equipment is actually different. The management of task competency is done by human resources, but the actual definition of what the task needs to do will be done by reliability and maintenance. And this is an important point. So it reminds us that both human resources and maintenance need to work together to establish what good looks like in terms of standards. We also need to track our changes Throughout all these questions, you've caught on that if I do have an item somewhere in the network and I change it, 
And again, we'll go back to the example of three little widgets sitting in the network. And we need to change it to a new world because it could be anything. It could be through obsolescence, design, change in parameters, etc. We only might need two of the items, so the other item out here will be replaced. How does one manage that change? Now, it's not just a physical change out of the particular item. You've got to go through and look at people, process, technology. You've got to look at the level of input, the level of output, and all these things holistically considered needs to be taken into fact because it's easy to change something physically, but if you do not inform your workforce that things have changed, you end up with first and foremost a safety concern, then a reliability concern, and then you're into cost. If we change something, what is the impact? You saw before, we're looking at cost, risk, and performance. Cost, risk, performance. In the center of that, of course, is value. And we need to understand if we lower cost, increase risk, or increase performance, what does it actually mean to the asset? Now, this slide here is very important, and it's on another video, but this is really decided by the asset manager. It is not decided by maintenance or operations, but it will be done in conjunction with the owner. So look, these are some questions that we've just gone through that you can actually ask in a very agnostic or generic sense that will bring people into the conversation. They don't even realize that they're thinking about asset management in the true sense of cost, risk, and performance. But what you're doing is asking these questions is you're building on alignment, assurance, leadership, and value. I hope you got something out of this video, and please look for other videos like this one on structuredchange.tv.